it's a big deal, you know, like, I mean, I still remember the first time I saw the, you know, the web, I was like, wow, everything's going to change. And the, really the first time I saw chat GPT, I was like, okay, now it's now game on, like everything's going to change in the next three years. And it's going to be a radical transformation of everything we know. Hello and welcome to episode 61 of Great Things with Great Tech, the podcast highlighting companies doing great things with great technology. My name's Anthony Spiteri and in this episode, we're talking to an AI and machine learning company that's helping organizations unlock the value of their data, leveraging cutting edge technology um, to extract insights and data to apply these to improve clients' products and services, helping organizations once again access their data and making better use of that. That company is Zionix, and I'm talking to co-founder and CEO, Deep Dillon. Welcome to the show, Deep. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Excellent. So just before we get into this amazingly relevant world of AI and ML and data science, just want to give a shout out for the show. If you love great things with great tech and would like to feature in future episodes, please click on the link on the show notes or go to gtwgt.com and register your interest. Just as a reminder, all episodes of GTWGT are available on all good podcasting platforms, Google, Apple, and Spotify, all hosted and distributed now, not by Anchor FM, but by Spotify Podcasts. That used to be Anchor. So that will keep you up to date with all the episodes, and please go to YouTube, like, and subscribe. So with that out of the way, Deep, let's um, let's dig into Zionix. There's so much to go through today, but I really want to start off by, you know, just introducing yourself. Um, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a pure data scientist. So I don't often um, have, you know, people of your field and, and, and your credibility on the show with regards to this field. It's something that I think people, you know, still aren't totally up to date with, um, but please just give us a bit of a background on yourself and then talk about Zionix and how you basically came to found this company, which was, I believe, started in about 2016. Yeah, well, thanks so much for your kind words and thanks so much for having me on the show. Um, I got into um, data science before data science was a word or before people used terms like AI um, without being really shy about it. Um, so I, I, you know, my graduate work was um, in a lot of adaptive signal processing. So kind of algorithms that aren't quite like machine learning, but, um, you know, we're mostly in the audio domain, but trying to basically get models to like sort of automatically like learn from an environment and figure out what to do from it. And I've been pretty active in the startup community here in Seattle for the last oh, two or three decades or so. <laughs> um, I've started a few companies. Uh, one of my companies was, um, you know, back in the late 90s, was a music identification and classification engine that okay. used a lot of machine learning back in the day. Uh, that was, um, that stuff's actually uh, done pretty well. We sold it to a company called Grace Notes, which got bought by Sony and uh, it's used in a few hundred home audio appliances. So a lot wow. of, um, yeah, quite a few people, if you, you know, if you put one of those apps like Shazam, you put a mic in the air, identifies a song. We built the kind of first versions of that. Um, wow, crazy. So that well, that, that's ago. awesome. Still out there. Um, and so then after that, I spent a number of years um, kind of when sort of deeper natural language processing was um, kind of a lot more in its infancy than what it is today. So uh, we built a large scale distributed um, kind of deep natural language processing engine. And um, this would be starting in the early 2000s up till about 20, 2010. Um, you can, the way I used to describe that system is it's like an army of seventh grade grammar students armed with a really large dictionary. Uh, so we could do like really exacting uh, queries. So, you know, from unstructured text, show me a list of all the people, you know, who flew helicopters near DC from just news, for example. This was um, interesting to like some of our DOD clients and in Biofarm, we'd ask stuff like, hey, show me a list of all the genes that inhibit the expression of a particular gene like ERBB2 in the mouse model or something. Yeah, I, so I, by of, the way, I understood every single word that you said just there. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. I was being a bit, I, I'm obviously oh. lying, but it's, but it's awesome to like hear that sort of stuff. Right. And, and I think we're going to dive into, you know, the why I think this is so important to have these sort of conversations today, because this, this is such a, this is such a different world to what I'm used to and having you on is just already, I'm just soaking up the, the info. So yeah, I just wanted to, to sort of highlight that, that this is where, this is why I've, we've got you on and why we've got Zionics on because yeah. I, want, I want to learn and everyone else wants to learn about this. Yeah, I apologize more. if I nerd out too much. No, 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 no. please, please, ne- geek, geek, geek out, geek out. I'll put, I'll, I'll put those acronyms in the show notes. <laughs> Yeah, so getting back to Zionic, so you know, so I've I've been kind of like a, a tech exec in various startups over the years, and what I found was in between companies um, that I would sort of go through this mode where I'd kind of have to unplug for a while because it's pretty exhausting. I'd usually travel, then I'd get home, and I'd have no idea what to do with my life, and I would <laughs> contemplate being a painter or something random. Yeah. And then a friend of mine would be like, hey, can you work on this problem? I'm trying to build a parser to automatically understand, you know, what patients are saying about their disease conditions or so. it, it could be anything. Yeah. And so then I would kind of like settle into, you know, a little side project. And then I'd eventually, you know, take on a new kind of techie kind of uh, more formal role. And I found after my last um, company that those were the most like fascinating and interesting st- parts of my career were those in-between moments where I was really just solving a particular machine learning problem for a particular domain in an area I didn't really necessarily know much about, but with people who are really trying to make a difference and 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 get something out. And so that's kind of the genesis of Zionics, yeah. which was, can we, um, like if you think about a lot or a ton of the machine learning talent is really like the deeper talent is locked up in some of the big five, big six tech companies. Mm-hmm. And then, but meanwhile, there's like a ton of other companies that, you know, don't have access to that kind of talent um, and don't really understand in depth what's going on. They can probably take some APIs and, you know, shovel some stuff around, but they, they're they not necessarily able to like really dig in and, and, and understand things. So I, I thought, can we maybe follow some of the rudiments of a SaaS company um, where, you know, where we can build models and have a heavy customization period on behalf of a customer and really get into their headspace, but talk like exec to exec sort of a thing yeah. um, so that you can speak this high level business language and then like really rapidly come out with very, with relatively little, you know, explicit direction, but come out with a transformative use of AI in their product so that they can have basically an engine of innovation over many years. And that's kind of the, the idea. Yeah. So it's almost like it's, it's um, like you almost alluded to there, it's AI or data science as a service effectively. Um, yeah. But not, but not necessarily at the API level. It's like, you know, think, you know, a higher level, you know, CEO even or yep. product leader, you know, or CTO who maybe doesn't have a lot of deep ML experience. Um, they say, uh, you know, hey, like this is, we have this intuition, we have some data, right? Could be a body of documents, could be a bunch of imagery, could be a bunch of recordings, um, whatever. We have some kind of intuition about something high value that can be done with it. And and we don't have the resources to like realize it, or we don't quite know what the next steps are, or we do, but we're not sure we want a third-party assessment. And so that's kind of the bulk of what we do. And we do yeah. have like a kind of a core mission too. You know, like the other thing is, you know, I had, I'd taken off some time and wandered around and while sitting, you know, in a hut, you know, a couple of miles from the nearest road, I was like, what am I going to do with my life? I feel like I've spent, you know, 30 years building morally agnostic hammers. You know, you can <laughs> use it to build a house for some poor family in Guatemala or something, or you can bludgeon somebody to death. And it feels to me like 99% of the tech companies out there are morally agnostic hammer builders. And I didn't want to do that. And so I thought, we'll make a simple test. If a five-year-old girl can answer a simple question, is the world better off if we do this? If she says, yes, we take the project. If she says, no, we might take the project because we might need the money or (laughs) might find it intellectually interesting and fascinating still. Um, But we oftentimes don't. So like, that's kind of the... So no, that's, hence that's, we have a lot of projects in healthcare and yeah, education. I saw that. Yeah. And, and that's really commendable, right? You, you're not only looking to to do something with awesome innovative technology, but you're looking to actually, you know, 
make a difference as well, I guess, is, is what you're trying to say there. And, and, and we will talk, we actually will talk about good and bad AI a little bit later on, but yeah, I think so. What I'm getting, you know, Zionics is all about, you know, tapping into some sort of data that exists, you know, that's being just generated by, by, by just attrition, just by the natural course of a business doing what it does or an organization doing what it does. And then trying to basically lock into that and seeing if you can derive some sort of value out of it with, with the skill set that you've got as a data scientist and your teams that you've got as well. And then you're basically building the models and then effectively, you know, running with that for that, those companies and effectively looking after that whole side of it. So they don't need to worry about, you know, hiring that talent, which you said was, effectively somewhat locked up and that's quite interesting when you say that is that just because it's such a new sort of part of our of our world that there isn't that many data scientists to go around or is it just a case of that the good ones are all taken effectively i think it's mostly the latter <laughs> yeah but i mean if you look at the salaries that like you know google and microsoft and facebook are giving like you know, just a bunch of friends of mine that I've worked with, I mean, they're making well over 750K a year. Wow. And so for a startup to kind of compete with yeah. that kind of income or even just a regular industry job where mm -hmm. there isn't necessarily the DNA to stomach such a salary for people, <laughs> which I, you know, I don't blame folks at all. I mean, it's no. just a completely insane amount of money. Yeah. Um, and, you know, part of the reason they're, you know, the big tech companies are paying so much is because there's just a potentially massively disproportionate amount of impact that, you know, that the top tier talent can have on a problem. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it is just kind of what it is. It's a combination of limitations on supply yeah. and, supply uh, mm. and really deep pocketed uh, companies who really get it. Yeah. That's um, kind of, people listening a lot now thinking hmm, should i get into that data science gig <laughs> with those sorts of salaries that's that's top in, in australian dollars that's well topping a million dollars a year right so yeah. th there you go no it's interesting space but i think for you guys you know obviously what you're doing you've got you know what, what sort of service at a very sort of you know top level like what sort of services do you offer like products or services obviously i've, I've look, had a look through your um your website but predictive analytics data visualization data management tooling um, is that kind of your bread and butter or is, it, or is it actually all mostly based on the model? And we'll talk about what a model is a bit later on. We're more like a, if you think of a design agency, you know, like we have a core competency where we're good at machine learning and AI, particularly formulating problems, formulating strategies, bringing them, working with product, um, um, with product managers and and engineers to like integrate the AI capabilities into products. So that's kind of our, our sweet spot. Excellent. Particularly uh, we do pro that said, we do projects in an, lots of different types of data. So we have a number of text projects that, you know, use large language models, um, you know, like the stuff that chat GPT is built on. And yep. uh, we also have uh, done some projects with audio. So for example, we built a, a smart stethoscope um, oh, you okay. know, for a, for a company that had a, an iPhone case-based um, stethoscope. Um, we've done a lot with video. So for a number of years, we built um, like in uh, in surgery room, in body um, video analysis capability to just sort of see like, hey, is the physician suturing now? Are they wow. cauterizing or placing mesh and helping ultimately power a, you know, a surgeon, a surgeon improvement feedback system. Um, so you know, and then like more recently, you know, we have, um, we've got a project where we're pairing up, pay, it's like match.com for doctors and patients. Um, that's, that's kind of how I would describe it. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's one. We have another one with a, a um, you know, a company that uh, works with college students and uh, sorry, with colleges. And it's, it's like a chat bot for students from the time they accept till the time they graduate, wow. kind of addressing all the practical question answering, like when does, you know, second semester start, when spring break to, you know, hey, I'm not feeling good and, yeah. you know, I've been sad or whatever. So wow. it's like, it's an array of projects yeah, at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day, what binds them all together is there's um, data, there's some in, some intuition that something high value can be done with it. There's some patterns naturally inherent in that data yep. and unlocking them is very valuable. Yeah. And hey, I don't swear often on the show, uh, but that's some really cool shit. 
Like, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, but on that, let's, let's move into this because what I, what I wanted to sort of grasp and for people out there who obviously AI has been thrown into the forefront of our world um, recently, you know, with chat GDP just absolutely dominating the airwaves. And obviously, like you said, I mean, this, 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 this science has been around for, for, for decades, right? Um, you know, because it is obviously just a thing when there's data, you can see insights, you can get telemetry out of it you can grab you know tangible information out of that so what is ai so this is my, my first question to you like wh how would you define artificial intelligence in this field i don't know how to answer that question so i'll try to answer from a few different angles oh, thank so as a, i thought we, i thought we had to a, stop the show <laughs> <laughs> as a machine learning you know practitioner i think of ai and I'm a little bit old school, but I think it was this goofy term that people who aren't into machine learning use to describe what we do. <laughs> so um, I would say that's kind of part of it. Uh, but that was sort of pre-deep learning, you know, where we really didn't think that the place that we're at today would happen in our lifetimes. Wow. Um, I think, I think at its core, you know, when we talk about this generation of machine learning and AI systems, we're talking about systems that ultimately um, have the ability to recognize patterns inherent in the data and make projections based on it. So one kind of key category, you know, within there we call supervised machine learning. So you can think of it as like example-based learning. So the example I often give is, you know, imagine you have a toddler who is coming up to speed on language and doesn't yet know the word furniture. So by example, you might show the toddler a chair and you might say furniture, show them a table, they say, and you say furniture, and then, you know, maybe you show them the sofa, same thing, you go outside and you point to a wicker chair and you say, what's this? And they say, not furniture. And you're like, well, it turns out that those things can also be outside. <laughs> okay. And so like, so through example, you're giving the system um, examples that define the thing and maybe define the not thing. And so that's an example of classification-based supervised machine learning, which is a lot of what we see. Um, and then there's a whole other category within AI that we call unsupervised machine learning, which is like, hey, you've got this bunch of data. Um, tell me stuff about it. So like, let's say you have a population of a bunch of customers who, and all their shopping habits, their buying habits. And uh, and then you kind of dig in there and you find out uh, some natural patterns in the data. So you might find, well, okay, well, this chunk of folks are like quick buyers. They, they jump on your website, they buy really quickly. And this chunk of um, customers are, you know, really hesitant and they wander around and they browse a bunch, that kind of thing. So, and I think, more in the last, you know, since deep learning came out, sort of one of the big breakthroughs, if you will, was to sort of, on some level, kind of marry the two. So to leverage the lack of structure. So let's take text as an example. If we yep. think about chat GPT and large language models, one of the big breakthroughs was to take like a big uh, body of unstructured stuff and instead of giving it little itty bitty examples of furniture and or how to read sent particular sentences in a particular way or how rating, you know, sentiment or something on IMDb reviews or something like that, instead um, we came up with this idea like, well, let's just um, teach the thing to predict future sequences of text. So, given some text, it predicts the next word. So, yeah. um, uh, he went to the blank okay, maybe store, maybe, um, you know, like there's a few words that fit into that sentence, but there's a lot of words that don't, like you don't go to the orangutan or, you know. Yeah, okay. So, so it turns out when you, when you do this and then you combine it with a neural network that has sort of a certain properties and topology that it gets incredibly bright. Like it, it turns out that you, in order to do this task well and predict future sequences of text, you've in essence learned language, not just English, but all the other languages that we're training it on from all this content on the web yeah. and not just human languages. You're also learning programming languages and you're yeah. learning how to, you know, common, uh, all those common patterns. And that's kind of the like base layer, if you will, of like what 
you know, chat GPT and this, this new generation of really smart chat bots is, is kind of leveraging. Yeah. So you talked about AI not being equal to ML and then you talked about deep, deep learning as well. So in terms of machine learning, where does that fit? Because obviously AI and ML get clumped together almost all the time. So, you know, is that, is that just because of something that's just become, you know, habitual in the industry or are they, do they, are they obviously from my end go together, but I'm trying to work out if machine learning is, is actually what you guys are really doing using that deep learning and AI is just the overall term that's given to it. I honestly, I just say like, if I'm talking to practitioners, we use machine learning. And if we're talking to, if we're trying to like, if it's marketing and we're trying to like <laughs> jazz it up, everything's AI. There you go. So yeah. uh, there's no, I mean, from a technology, from a technologist standpoint, AI is like the marketing -y term um, or, but some people can kind of use it for these much larger models that are more generalized and doing stuff that's like, wowie, you know, as opposed yeah. to kind of more narrow stuff. But even these really large models, people are now doing narrow things on top of them. Does that make them not AI, even though they're using the same quote, you know, mind or brain, if you will? Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's largely, it's largely like terminology that, you know, that kind of flies about. But most technical people use the term machine learning to mean much the same thing. Yeah, because I kind of, and to your, you've, you've actually articulated it beautifully, right? In terms of, you know, there's, a, there's an element of marketing, there's an element of excitement, there's an element of fear that gets brought in with AI. Like, I think that's a very mm -hmm. real sort of thing that we feel with it because we've been, we've been trained ourselves, if we want to, you know, kind of almost put it together. We've been trained to fear artificial intelligence almost all of my, all of my life i know that i've been trained to fear what happens like will the robots rise ai is eff effectively always going <laughs> to end up in a really bad way i've i've read a couple of books um nova scene and a, a few other ones that talk about the cyber, rise of cyborgs and so i think ai is used to leverage the the, the emotion of what it is and then the marketing angle um but yeah at, at the at the at the back end of that it's all the cool stuff that you guys do as, as data scientists. So as, as a data scientist, like how would you, for anyone starting off, how would you classify that? Like how would they go and I'm assuming at universities now there's, there's just data science courses and whatnot, but is that kind of the path to it? Is that how you got to it? Or did you start in some other way to become a data scientist and work where you work? Yeah, I, um, as far as me personally, I came up through um, a field electrical engineering Right. And within electrical engineering, I mean, I'm, this is showing my age a bit, but, you know, digital signal processing was really big. So, you know, like, so I was kind of looking at algorithms like adaptive noise cancellation, you know, like how those algorithms work. Yeah, cool. And so, um, so like the math's all really similar. It's not very difficult math. It's generally like linear algebra and, you know, and some, and some, probability and statistics are valuable, yeah. but people, people have kind of come to machine learning from a lot of different disciplines, you know, at least in my generation of folks, whereas now I think a lot are coming from straight CS background. But um, I think you're almost like, you know, I mean, I've, we've had clients, um, I was working closely with a, a couple of uh, professors at Columbia University, they have like one runs a, a history lab that where they, they literally are all like political science and history grad students. They're all doing machine learning yeah. and, you know, another one that's, that's in the literature department, you know, like analyzing texts and using the same techniques on classical literature texts as, uh, as they, as they use on, you know, analyzing social media uh, posts around vaccine hesitancy, for example. Yeah. And so AI and machine learning techniques are in probably every department in a graduate school in any university at this point. And so it really depends kind of like, what do you want to do, right? Like if you want to be coming up with new network topologies that are going to be really transformative and you want to really get at the most core basic part of the models, then probably computer science uh, is your best discipline. And um, that's probably the place to, you know, to really focus and just take a lot of 
extra math and stats and, and off, machine yeah. learning classes. Yeah, which is but, cool. My son's doing linear algebra right now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm enjoying doing it. I'm, I'm not saying he's going to, and he enjoys it as well. But yeah, it's good. I might tell him it's, uh, it's, this is, this is something like he goes, why do I need to do this, dad? I'm like, well, you know, in the future, this is kind of the stuff that's at the core of a lot of what, what's, what's going to drive our world, basically, right? Yeah, it's, it's impactful stuff, you know. I mean, this is the, the, you know, the dirty little secret of grad school is most of most folks are using math from, you know, 100 years ago or earlier. <laughs> I mean, it takes a long time for today's mathematicians work to be harnessed in the real world. So, yeah. so yeah, but... Hey. Um, that's what that's what I'd say. And then there's, you know, of course, to be a good data scientist, you know, like being able to program is is key, you yeah. know, being able to, you know, know how to write software. So I think that that angle makes sense uh, to spend some to get really good at. I think that's what really differentiates the kind of great folks from the maybe more um, OK folks is can you like take your ideas and get them from concept to reality in short order? Right. And that really often comes down to different types of programming skills, you know, like having some basic, you know, being able to jockey some Python and transform your data is one thing and certainly valuable, but, you know, being able to operate in a distributed computing environment and spin something off onto a few hundred machines or a few thousand nodes and get something done is another area of computer yeah. science to get decent at. And then there's, you know, the actual algorithmic side. And then there's just like a lot of intuition. It's it's very much still art more than 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 anything else. So it's almost like you've got to be a combination of jobs and Wozniacki, effectively. I think that's what keeps it interesting though. You yeah. know, it's like why I mean, I was chatting with my wife the other day and I'm like, yeah, I don't I feel like I'm supposed to do something else with my life in addition to this, but I really don't know what else it would be. And every time I you know, try to do something else, I just wind up back here because it's just too interesting. <laughs> so like... Maybe that's something you can chat about with uh, from a behavioral therapy point of view with ChatGDP, <laughs> which I know yeah. you've done in the past. Um, that's really interesting in itself. Hey, I just wanted to talk a little bit. You, you've mentioned model a couple of times, and I think that's the one that we hear quite often from the outside. So, so what, what is a model? Yeah, so let's... So let me see if I can come up with a, a simple example. So like everybody think back to your, you know, your eighth grade uh, math class where you might have, you know, had an X and a Y axis. And so your X is like a variable, like let's say square footage. And um, the Y is a different variable, um, you know, let's say number of stories and we're describing a house, right? So in this, little x y axis like really big mansions are going to have a lot of square footage presumably and maybe a number of stories and really tiny houses might be like one story with not so much square footage and if you look at that across like a bunch of you know houses um now you can make a quote model where given square footage and um and number of stories you could quote predict uh you know what the um let's say, uh, let's add another variable like price, you know, what okay. the price might be. Yeah. And so the, so the model is sort of the act. So like you can imagine in the simplest case, like everything kind of falls along that diagonal, like those points, like you get bigger houses, you got more square footage and maybe it like jumps up a step. Every time you add a new floor, you can throw on another couple thousand square feet or something. And so you wind up with some kind of curve or, or function or some, some smattering of dots and like a simple line, like a linear regression, you just plop a line on there. And now your model is just that line. Um, and so, you, you know, given one or two variables, you can predict the third. So it, it, when it comes to machine learning, it's basically that, but instead of like those nice little two dimensional things that we can envision or we could in like eighth grade math, you know, now it's, you know, maybe three or four or five or a million or wow. a billion dimensionality. So it gets to be a much larger dimensional space. And maybe we can't just throw a line on it. So we have to have a network that learns how to um, minimize the error from the thing it's predicting to the other thing. And that that all that stuff we call the model. The act of training the model is training the part to be able to do the prediction. And then the inference are, is the, the act of once we've trained the model, being able to give it some input, like in this case, the square footage and the, 
number of stories and have it spit out the you know the price or yeah. some category or whatever awesome no that's even i understood that so that's that's good <laughs> so yeah i think that's a great way to, to look at it um uh, let's let's move quickly to you know chat gdp because obviously i think you've mentioned it a couple of times um we know that you know in december it kind of took over the world um and i think from that that point of view it's just brought ai uh, to the forefront right and people are generally excited and scared about it so um you know what what sets what sets open ai's chat gdp apart and obviously there was mid journey as well for image processing which was crazy in itself um but yeah what's for you kind of had chat gdp just come on and take the world by storm like it did yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question because we've had large language models for a few years now. And for those of us who are familiar with working them with them day to day, there was nothing super radical about chat GPT, but they did put a really important kind of reinforcement learning layer on top. So one of the things about, so, I'm, so remember that model I described where you can predict yeah. future sequences of text. So you take that thing and you can ask it, you know, like, questions um and it you know like uh, it, it, all the kinds of stuff you would ask chat gpt and it'll give you like you can ask it repeatedly and you'll get different answers each time and a good chunk of time it will wow you and a not insignificant chunk of time it will completely butcher it right and so you, you kind of have to really ta tailor it and so what open ai did was they actually put a whole layer on top that is this reinforcement learning that said, and they, they, as far as I understand it, they, you know, they hired um, tons of folks, I think in Kenya to actually do a lot of this labeling. Oh, wow. Nobody really knows for sure. They've been pretty tight lipped about most stuff, yeah. but they, but they, you know, they just started like asking it, you know, a lot of uh, questions and it gives answers. And then these humans are like selecting towards the, you know, the optimal um, answers are like high quality answers across a set of normal large language permutations. And so that layer of uh, on top of the LLM is like a really important layer that uh, other folks are now, you know, racing to reproduce. Yeah, and um, okay. yeah, no, go ahead. So I would say that's like a good part of what makes ChatGPT different. And the other part that I think was pretty um, important was just simply having a a simple little interface on it. Yeah, so absolutely. A, it's a text box. It's super intuitive. But B, um, so before ChatGPT with the LLMs, you know, you had to you had to kind of do these prompting. So you would have to give it a few examples. It was a little bit nerdy, like you had to use some, you know, some kind of cryptic stuff. And they the chat interface, it turns out, is pretty good at like kind of coaxing the the prompts out. And it's really intuitive for humans. And um, the other thing is they kind of maintain some state. So so it retains some of the prior information that isn't necessarily what's happening with this kind of like one and done um, LLM stuff. So I think all of that kind of contributed um, to, oh, and that, and then I think they also put some guardrails on it, which I think yeah. probably it would have taken off without the guardrails. Um, but that's a lot of work actually to tame these beasts because they can say completely inane and stupid things so. yeah because basically oh, i've just seen that chat gdp4 is starting to trend on twitter so there you go it must be released um but no but i think um to that end i think the guardrails are important because obviously you know the, the data that it's sourcing yeah you know, there can be a lot of dodgy stuff in there right and i think that's part of the, the art of what they've done is been able to protect the responses to a certain extent certainly people have been able to you know to coax it into you know, giving some, you know, some, some dodgy answers and some not so great answers because that's the nature of, of the beast. Right. But I, I know actually it's a great example from the coaxing was that I actually asked it yesterday, you know, tell me some stuff about Zionics. Right. And at first it said, I don't know about that company. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then I kind of said, well, Hey, Zionics do, they're an AI and ML. They're based out of, out of Seattle founded in 2016. And then it came back and said, Oh yeah, I, actually, I do know a little bit about it, you know, sorry about that. And actually it like apologized to me. And then it basically started to get a little bit more information, but that first information was basically what I fed it. Okay. And then I said, are you sure you don't know anything more about Zionics? At that point, it's like, and I was surprised at this because I didn't know, I always thought it was a finite sort of cutoff date and whatever, but it basically then came up and said, yep, here's all the information on Zionics. This is what they do. This is the services they offer. So it was interesting that at that first prompt, 
I'm not sure if it was a competitive thing or whatever, but it basically just said you don't exist. And then I had to basically manipulate it a little bit to say, hey, it actually does exist. What, what, what part of it is that all about? Because that's quite interesting, the whole, whole coaxing thing. Yeah, I don't know for sure, but my guess is um, they, you know, when they define these guardrails, like in addition to, you know, really um, assigning credibility to content. So, which is one of the reasons it answers things so well is they, they I think they did spend a lot of time and effort on that. It, it seems clear from the output, but, um, but in addition to that, you know, those guardrails, part of their guardrails was to kind of steer away from instances of things. So if, if you ask um, chat GPT, at least pre um, GPT four, so like 3.5, if you ask it about specific politicians or specific um, companies or financial, like anything that gets too much into details, their guardrail system kind of tries to steer it away from that. And I think that's their, kind of first major attempt to avoid being accused of giving financial advice or yeah, avoid being absolutely. accused of giving doctorly advice, you know, yeah. or things like that. So I'm guessing that that's probably what is going on there. So, yeah. And, and look, just on that, obviously, you know, when we're talking about good and evil, um, to, to put it into that sort of biblical term, and we talked about the fact that AI breeds all this emotion, what I'm seeing is a proliferation of AI companies out there at the moment. It seems to be the in thing. And I've, I've, I've kind of linked it to the DeFi crypto craze where everyone was trying to get in on that and, and make money. And obviously there's always some bad actors in any space, in any technology that comes out. So in your sort of opinion, what's the difference between good AI and bad AI? You mean from like a morally good or bad standpoint, or do you mean from a quality standpoint? I think I think both work. I think you know, if, uh, I think you can answer it as both parts, right? Morally, yeah. Let's start with there because obviously that's quite interesting. And then I also think just from the point of view of people just trying to cash in, uh, I'm trying to say that they are an AI company with maybe at the back end they're all just using the same the same system effectively, and they're trying to trying to sort of put a new skin on it, so to speak. So from a moral standpoint, it's not obvious how to think about it exactly because it's it's kind of complicated. But I'll tell you about the ways I think about it. Um, there's the it's a hammer um, analogy. Ask yourself, are you building a house for you know a family to live in, or are you bludgeoning somebody to death? And that from that lens, it's pretty obvious. You can use machine learning to you know help you break into people's credit cards or you know all, like all kinds of nefarious activity, and you can use uh, you know AI or ML to do all kinds of good things like uh, identify heartbeat anomaly and anomalous conditions or make you know, a physician a little bit faster or help address, you know, um, help a therapist be a little more efficient or whatever. Then there's, there's like a different, so that's, that one seems kind of straightforward. Um, but there's, there's another lens that I think is a little bit different. It's like, um, so you've got the, the Hollywoody thing, which is, you know, you've got this Terminator like vision, which I think is so grandiose that it's kind of pointless to even think about. Because I think as far as an arch villain goes, that's not how it exactly happens. It sort of happens more innocently, right? Like, so the example I'd like to give is if you go um, back in time a little bit, you know, on in YouTube, on Google, and you look at, um, so somebody did an experiment where they started with a, a campaign speech of uh, Hillary Clinton uh, on the left of center and uh, Donald Trump on the right, and you just looked at the recommendations that come back from this system, right? So you so you take that campaign video, and then you click on one of the recommended videos at random, watch that video, click on one of those at random. And it turns out in both cases, um, you wind up going down the Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole. And at the end, you're in completely insane conspiracy theory wow. BS land. Yeah. And that is an example of real harm that was done. And if you ask for the causes of it, conspiracy theories will come up with all, well, you know, those evil folks at Google tried to whatever, but that's mm -hmm. not really how it happened, right? Like what happens is, you have to come up with a cost function to optimize, right? When you build these algorithms, you have to say like, well, hey, 
what am I optimizing for? And at YouTube, obviously they're probably optimizing for engagement. Like they want people to watch as much as possible because ultimately their money comes from, from ads and they're running ads and nobody sat down and said, Hey, let's make an evil, you know, recommendation engine that yeah. takes, that starts spewing nonsense. But the models are so powerful and so um, good that they figured out that if you want to optimize engagement, the way to do that is to give somebody something slightly kookier and slightly weirder and slightly scarier than the time before. Yeah. And if you do that, then you get them to stick around. You also get them to storm the Capitol, you know, and yeah. just be nutters, yeah. like beyond belief. And that's the kind of evil that I think is very real and very problematic. And every data scientist needs to push back hard with their product managers and others. And all, all everyone in tech needs to like, un, like figure out where our collective, you know, where the good conscience lies. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's really interesting in itself. I, I know I, I listened to a couple of um, interviews with Mr. Beast, um, who's obviously a top top YouTuber in the world, right? From that point of view, and he was openly saying that he knows that he has to put some some level of negativity, um, or at least excitement that is on the negative side into his titles and into his um, thumbnails as well, because that's what draws people in and that's what sends people down that rabbit hole. So yeah, you're spot on there. It's, it seems to be, you know, the fact that if it's driven by the algorithm, driven by money, then there's the potential for it to be not that great. So from a moral standpoint, you know, everyone who's in the, in the space needs to kind of be aware of that and, you know, be okay with effectively what they do, right? People end up, you know, getting paid for their, their service, their speciality. And I guess if they're being paid to do something that a company wants them to do, they might justify that in themselves. And therefore they can't avoid, you know, the, the, the nefarious activity that might come of it. Um, but you're kind of saying that in the back of everyone's mind in the space, they should be aware of the potential impact. Yeah, and I think it's more than in the back of your mind, right? Like if we look at the area of, you know, ethics and AI, which is sort of a really important emerging area, there's like, there's, it needs to be more than just in the back of your, your head. Like you have to really ask yourself, how is this algorithm going to bias negatively particular populations of humans too? Like that's another aspect, right? Like if you're training up, you know, an algorithm to like automatically label people as beautiful or not, I don't know, like some weird dating app yeah. and you only use people from a particular, you know, ethnic demographic group, uh, and then you take it, you know, into a, uh, you know, like some other completely different place, like you train it in Norway and you take it to Botswana or something. And then it always says like, not, hot, not hot, not hot, not hot. Well, you know, you can argue like, well, oh, well, the bio algorithm's obviously biased. It's like, no, that's on the data scientists and that's on the product managers because that's an obvious thing to like think through. Yeah, but you just chose not to think it through and your startup chose not to like, it chose to like, move, or your company chose to move it into a new area without really thinking things through. So I, I think that the data itself and the potential, like bias is what these models do. I mean, that that's the point. But there's, there's, you know, harmless bias and then there's like potentially harmful bias. Like another example, you know, that I think is, is out there. So, you know, I used to, um, uh, you know, work for a company that did a lot of, we, we build a whole platform to help governments, um, you know, mine data effectively and uh, make it available for other people to build apps. So, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like, hey, you know, all of the, um, taxi license data in the city of Chicago would go online and then anyone could, somebody built an app for an iPhone to check on whether or not you have a license that day. I mean, like it's, it's kind of a weird quirk of that particular city, yeah. but that, that you get a license for a day <laughs> as a taxi driver. But, um, but there's like another application, which is like this arena called predictive policing. So, you know, you it turns out you can pretty accurately predict where crimes are going to happen and wow. even when they're going to happen. And so cities, to their credit, said like, hey, you know, you, you can't use like ethno-demographic data in those models to predict that crime. So everyone thought, okay, well, we're off the hook as long as we use like a lat long coordinate, uh, you know, some, some temporal history, the magnitude of like the crime type, uh, and then the, the crime location. Like we're good. Well, it turns out that those are still like proxy variables for all this other stuff. 
And so what's going to end up happening is it's going to end up routing the police to go sit in a few like camp out in a few neighborhoods that, you know, that other variables that you that you rightfully so omitted from the data set are still being represented, even though the data looks sort of tame. <laughs> yeah, and that's and very strict. minority reporter. That's like, that's that's totally. A but it's a real thing, and report. there's companies wow. that that make predictive policing apps, and it works. So that's crazy. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Hey, we could we could talk about a lot of this stuff for another couple of hours, but I, I do want to kind of try and, and, and sort of wrap up and tie it back to Zionics. And you know, you, you've obviously you've got this wealth of knowledge in this industry, which you know is amazing. I've learned so much just in this last sort of 30 or 40 minutes chatting to you um i just wanted to get your idea from a zionics point of view like what, what does the future hold for zionics as a company like short term medium term and then long term if you can if you, if, if we can go that far and i'm not going to give any dates on that so i'll, I'll let you kind of detect, detect what that means yeah, well, like in the short term and medium term, you know, we love helping our clients um, integrate machine learning and AI capabilities into their products that, you know, are the type of products that make the world, you know, a better place, at least uh, generally, according to our, you know, our sort of ethical anchoring. And um, so that's what we do today, um, being able to do that more <laughs> like with more companies and more potential impact and uh and have a net even greater positive impact on the world is you know where we want to be you know in the future um i you know i see us over time getting you know a lot of uh, sort of helping our customers you know fish for themselves you know and being able to to teach them to fish a lot faster and uh, and get sort of a lot more of this capability of like ramping up a project really quickly, getting training data really quickly, getting early outputs really quickly, um, being agile about it, getting it integrated in your product, getting it tested uh, and validating your business hypothesis, like all that methodology that's a part of our DNA and what we sort of do when we employ a project, being able to like come up with, you know, capabilities to facilitate others being able to do that more. So. I feel like if we're successful, like AI that's ethically considered and very impactful and filtered towards problems that are very um, kind of net beneficial to humanity, I feel like if we're successful, then there will just be a whole heck of a lot more of that in the world, meaning a better world, like that's less awesome. people getting sick, faster, safer, more efficient surgeries, you know, um, more predictive uh, sort of assessments of health conditions, whether that's from like, you know, your blood or your, you know, your stool, which sounds gross, but that's, you know, that's a project. Um, of I've, already, ours. I've, already, I've already said shit on the episode one. So, yeah, so, <laughs> or, you know, yeah. So like, like all of our health indicators and being sent into, to look up a particular problem that is latent, you know, but now can suddenly, um, you know, if addressed early, you know, extends your lifespan by quite a bit, like all those kinds of, I mean, there's just the, the, the capa the possibilities are really just, just they're just so broad. So, you oh, know, we hope to play uh, our small part in that, you know, yeah. in that evolution. It's, it's, it's on one level, it's grandiose in, in a sense, if you know what I mean, but I think it also represents just how important and how critical this area is to humanity in general, right? And I don't often get deep on this show, but I think you've 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 painted a really good picture of you know AI for good, solutions made simple. That's kind of your catchphrase, right, from a Zionics point of view. But generally speaking, um, this is where I think this field, you know, should be more excitable than scary for a lot of people um, that that are just thinking about how AI can impact you know, not just the world, but also our own personal daily lives and our lives moving forward for ourselves and our kids and whatnot. So it's why I'm really interested in it. You know, I'm trying to consume as much information as I can on this because I, I know that I can't contribute directly like like you can and like your company can, but I certainly want to know enough about it. So, you know, when it comes time to take a little bit of an advantage from it or even leverage it for something good that I can do, I'm going to be ready for it at the same time. So it's very commendable, you know, what you're doing, you know, your life's work effectively here. You kind of, you, you questioned yourself a little bit in terms of what you, you know, what am I doing? But I, I think you're doing great work and 
you know, I'm really, you know, pleased that I had you on the show because I think it was just an awesome conversation, not only about what Zionix are doing, but just AI in general. I think people that have listened to the show now have a really good, almost layman terms understanding of what the AI is, ML, you know, deep learning models, everything that we got into, um, even LLMs. I know that acronym. That's large language <laughs> <laughs> models. Yeah. So there you go. Awesome, yeah. man. Well, hey, thank you for being on the show. Um, I'm just going to finish off by saying again, once again, if you're not uh, subscribed or you're new to the show and you like what you hear, you can go to the podcast client and subscribe. Go to YouTube, hit like and subscribe there or go to gtwgt.com. And again, register your interest there. All the episodes are on there. This episode will be there with the show notes at the same time. Thank you, Deep. Thank you to Zionix. And we will see you next time on Great Things with Great Tech. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Beautiful. No worries. And cut. <laughs>